exhausted yet pursuing. Have you ever felt that way? There have been some times when I have felt exhausted in the work of the Lord, but still pursuing God's plan for my life. And many times we do feel that way. But uh, what I want you to really understand here is God says, keep pursuing. Don't give up doing what God has told you to do, even though everything turns against you. No matter what the situation, keep trusting God. That's pursuing. Financially, you could be in a very bad situation. Those times do come to many of the people of God. But don't, keep, don't waste time in giving up. Keep on trusting the Lord. There may be other ways that you are exhausted. You're exhausted in trying to bring up a child that is unruly. Keep pursuing. Do it God's way. Keep loving them and ministering the love of God to them. I was so glad as I grew up, my parents would never give up on me. No matter what the situation, can you imagine I might have been naughty sometimes? Well, you've got a good imagination because I probably was. But I didn't have them give up on me. They pursued training up a child in the way he should go. And they knew that when he was old, God would bring him back if he went away. I never went away, but I did need that pursuing by parents who loved me. Whatever the situation in a marriage, a lot of marriages break up simply because they give up. They don't keep on pursuing and that means they don't keep on trusting God to bring that marriage to a good conclusion. They give up. Someone told me, if my husband would only, if he would only, and this is many years ago, so don't try to apply it to anyone here, if he would only stop working as much as he's working and spend some time with me. So I counseled him and his wife in those areas, and he never did give up pursuing work after work after work, and the marriage split up. God gave them the solution. They needed time together. They needed to get to know each other. But they didn't pursue God's plan, and it ended up in their divorce. Here's Gideon. Gideon, a man of God. Gideon was not the kind of individual you'd think would be the best pick for God. And neither are we, but he still picks us. God will take the individual that the world says is a loser, and God will transform that individual into a light that changes people around them because it's the gospel light. I remember when I was growing up and I was in high school, my guidance teacher told me because I was lousy, to say it least, in math. My brother had all the smarts. He, he was an algebra teacher. He taught math. That was his main thing. But somehow it did not pass on to me. Well, the guidance teacher said, don't go on to college. Don't go on to college. You can't make it because you don't know math. Well, she didn't know God's will. She did not go know God's will. If I had not kept on pursuing because God had called me to be a minister, even when I was a child, I felt the call of God on my life. And you know the story about me preaching to the birds and my neighbors hearing and uh, commenting to my father. You got quite a little preacher there. Well, then, then that wasn't enough. I had uh, children come together in the neighborhood, and we had a little service, and they came. And as I told you before, they came because we took an offering and then went down to the candy store. 
That was the exciting reason they tolerated me having these little services. But I kept on pursuing when the guidance teacher said, you can't make it in a college. So I found a college, it accepted me, and in four years, God gave me marks that were remarkable because of God, and then seminary became another three-year opportunity. The guidance teacher did not understand the power of God. The power of God is overwhelming. Whatever God calls you to, you can do it. If it's the call of God, God will supply what you need. In all of his power, he can supply everything I need to do whatever he's called me to do. So there's nothing that you and I cannot do because of God giving us the wherewithal to do it. Gideon was such a man. He took 300 individuals, and he, by that time, was exhausted, but he was still pursuing the will of God. Gideon's life is a perfect example to each one of us of how God creates impossible situations that his name may be glorified in meeting those situations. There is nothing, nothing, and I repeat that over and over, there is absolutely nothing you can't do if God calls you to do it. The Lord called this shy man, and that's the way he's described, to lead Israel into battle against an overwhelming enemy. Think of this. A hundred thousand Midianites, that was their army, against Israel's 22,000. Now, God says, that is enough but I'm going to teach you something else. I'm going to teach you how to rely on me for the impossible. And in your life and in my life, God is trying to teach us the same thing, to rely upon him for impossibilities. We often will ask God for things that are, well, we know he can do it. But have you ever asked God for things that you don't believe he can do, but recognize it is a large step in faith to believe it. I have, and I've seen God come through. Uh, 22,000 against 100,000. Let's all go home. We're in defeat. No, we're not. Now, that anointing gives me more words. <laughs> All right, now, talk about not having the resources. I can't do that. I don't have the resources. I don't have the ability. I don't have the talent. I, I just can't do that. Have someone else do that. A lady, a pastor's wife that we had in the ministry years ago was asked to teach a certain age group group. She was a teacher of little kids, but she wasn't a teacher of this age group. And God said, ask her to teach teenagers. She panicked. She panicked. Now, I didn't ask her to teach teenagers because it was something she could do and she was familiar with. She was going to have to, if God had called her, and she, I told her, you check with God. If God has called you to do this, check with him because you need to have his power to accomplish it. Well, she did, and she found out God gave her the ability to do what she considered was impossible for her to do. God has always a task for you and I to do that's over our heads. It's beyond anything we can even imagine would be how God would use us. Gideon believed and acted on God's words. 
That's the thing I want you to see about precious servant Gideon. He knew he couldn't do it, even when he had 22,000. But he said, if you tell me to do it, I'll do it. Whatever you tell me to do, I'm going to endeavor to do it because I know you can give me what I need. But God wasn't through with Gideon. God made an even more impossible task for him to do. 22,000 against 100,000. Well, God, you can certainly win that battle. And it wouldn't be our strength. It would be your strength. But God isn't going to leave it at that size. He's going to reduce it and keep on reducing it. I see four great lessons in Gideon's story. Four great lessons for you and for me. Lesson number one on the screen. Limited resources never limit God. Limited resources never limit God. We have limited resources in this ministry, but we have all we need to do what God has chosen us to do. Whether it's financial, whether it's spiritual, whether it's an emotional situation, I have all I need if I will trust God, but God's going to test my faith. Your faith is at one level right now, and God wants to deepen your faith as he wants to deepen my faith so that we become men of God that believe him and women of God that believe him. And I've, I'm afraid with a lot of people in the church they have limited God, and therefore they have not experienced what God has truly for them in spiritual growth. God is never limited in his resources when he calls us to do something. Now, you've got to be sure he calls you, but when you know he calls you, don't start looking inward. Start looking upward. Whatever God calls you to do, and I'll say it throughout this message, you go to God for the power and the strength to accomplish it so that you give praise to the Lord. You give all praise to the Lord because you know you didn't do this without God doing it through you. The grace of God is all I need. If we were in Gideon's shoes, we might think this statement Lord, you've got to deliver right now. We need reinforcements. We need better weapons. And you know what, God? We need more supplies. Otherwise, we haven't got a chance. You don't need any of those things. We think in America we need a strong army, and I'm all for strong armies. But we don't need that to succeed if God is for us. We have the ability of God to do that which we cannot do. Israel in the seven-year war, think about that, seven-day war, excuse me. They didn't have the ability to win, but they won. Think of it. Returning to Israel as a nation when that was impossible, they were scattered throughout the world. But God had predicted it was going to happen in a certain time frame, and it happened as God said, not because of their strength, but because of God's strength. God maneuvered situations to establish his nation. In the last administration, he maneuvered Trump to make Jerusalem the capital of Israel as far as the world was concerned, as far as they were concerned, it was already. But that was a fulfillment of prophecy. It isn't a political situation. It's God doing the impossible when it's his chosen time to do it. 
The word of God makes it very, very clear that God has to be in the equation. If we're going to have victory, God has to be the one that gives us that victory. What did God do in this situation with Gideon? He did just the opposite of supplying what they thought they needed. He said to Gideon, listen to this. Any of your 22,000 men that are distraught or discouraged, tell them to go home. Tell them to go home. I don't have enough men as it is to have success. Yes, you do. You do because of me, not because of your men, not because of your abilities, not because of anything that's in you, but it's all in me. God saved me by his grace. It wasn't something that was in me. I wasn't uh, good enough to go to heaven. No one is. We have filthy rags as our righteousness. But God imputed to me when I received him as my Savior, his righteousness. So God the Father sees me through the blood of Christ as pure and spotless. Am I? Not in my experience, but in my position I am before God, cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. I am a child of Almighty God, destined for heaven, and I can't change that because the gifts and callings of God are without God ever changing his mind. And when he saved me, he saved me for eternity. Gideon, you've got to reduce. You've got to reduce because you're still relying on your 22 thousand men to give the victory you're still trying to figure this out without my intervention those that remain heard these words those of you who have a willing spirit now that's after the others went home there's a few now and he says, if you have a willing spirit, and he goes on to say, set your minds now to do battle with an enemy ten times your size. I'm going home. The average individual who is looking at the situation and trying to figure out how God can ever have success when you don't have the people that you need and the supplies you need and the weapons you need. How can I have success? Please keep on viewing Israel because God said they're going to have success. They're going to have torment. They're going to have challenges. They're going to have everything come against them, but he will establish his kingdom one day with his people and we will be there at that time. You see, with God, all things are possible. Again and again and again, I want to say to everyone, everywhere in the world, with God, all things are possible. The Midianites were much stronger and they were much fiercer. They were like some of the fierce people that are coming against Israel today. But this is what he said. But you, you have me on your side. Ever since this church was established many years ago, it has gone up, gone up, gone down, gone up, gone down, had trials, had tribulations, but then God gives success and a new challenge. Every time we've recognized that God was with us. God is with us. If he's with us, he's with you if you're a child of God. Keep on. Keep on pursuing. Don't become distraught at the situation or circumstances in your life. Say, with God, I'm going to succeed. 
I'm going to succeed. Number two on the screen, God often limits our resources to ensure he receives all the glory. He limits our resources, our abilities, so that he gets the glory. Jesus is not going to let you and I get the glory. We get some honor for being the servants of God, but he gets the glory. All glory to the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He is the one that deserves the glory. And we simply serve him because we're his servants by faith in Jesus Christ. If you were Gideon and you were in his shoes, would you believe that? Would you believe that? Would you believe that God is going to come through for you when God keeps doing things that seem to indicate you're going to have defeat? Well, the word of God goes on to say God often limits our resources, and I gave that to you to ensure he receives the glory. Don't forget that. All glory belongs to Jesus Christ. Here is where God made things even more difficult for Gideon. God isn't through testing our faith. He isn't through trying to mature us in our faith. He isn't through until the day we go to heaven to be with him. He told him in Judges 7, verse 2, the people with you are too many. What? They're ten times greater than us. And you want us to reduce again? I cannot give the Midianites, he said, into your hands because you're going to boast. You're going to boast that you did it in your own strength. When I realize, this is God speaking, that you can't do it in your own strength any longer and you acknowledge that. When you acknowledge you can't give up alcohol if you're an alcoholic in your own strength, you cannot give up any vice you have in your own strength and you've tried and tried and failed and failed. You can't even keep a New Year's resolution if you make them. I'm going to reduce you to the place where you know I need Jesus. I need Jesus. My need I now confess. So the word of God says, some of our battles, number three on the screen, exist to teach us to worship. Some of our battles are given to us to teach us to worship the one who is giving us all power, and all strength, and all guidance, and all that he is. It is Jesus who is my king I'm not a king under Jesus. I'm a servant under Jesus. That's just what happened with Gideon. When he saw that God was going to supernaturally deliver them, when he actually saw that from a powerful enemy, as the Midianites were, even before it happened, he went straight to his knees. Listen to Judges 7.15. As soon as Gideon heard this, he worshipped. He did not worship on his feet. He worshipped on his knees. Honoring the one whom he now knew was a, his deliverer. He wasn't going to use even the few to deliver he was going to rely on God, who was the only one that could give him victory. He was now learning a very valuable lesson. Not by strength nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. The victory comes through God. I finished seminary in victory 
finished my first church in victory, finished this church well, I don't know. It isn't finished yet, but it will be finished in victory because I've learned that Jesus is my source of victory. It isn't me. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. Note number four on the screen. When we see that he alone can bring about victory, that Jesus is the only one that can bring victory to our situation, and that he promises to deliver us in a way he can do. Our hearts turn to worship and praise, and the world steps back in awe. There's a people, there's an individual that trusts God. Some of those that had hidden their relationship with God and are very well known in some circles have now come out of the shadows and they're proclaiming it's Jesus. It's Jesus. I can no longer tolerate Hollywood in its ways. I have to go the way of my God. I can't tolerate politics as it is lived and showed to be a lie in many circles. It's Jesus I must follow. All the way my Savior leads me. It is Jesus in these last days before he comes for his church. It's Jesus who wants to be the one that we give praise to and glory to and thanksgiving to and depend on for victory in our situations. So Gideon clearly had his eyes open toward heaven. And he sent soldiers home, all 12,000 of them. Remember, he didn't have that many to begin with. And now 12,000 of those fighters go home. This reduced his army to more than half, down to 10,000. Well, with God, we can do it with 10,000 you're still relying upon your ability to do it. We're still relying upon what we have as our resources in ourselves to have the victory. But by the time God gets through, it's got to be God or it's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. The Word of God makes it clear the odds were te 10 to 1. God once more surprised Gideon. Judges 7, verse 4. The Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Why didn't he deal with this at the beginning and just get rid of them? Because he's teaching Gideon to live by faith. He's getting him to the point where he recognizes he's a loser without God, so it has to be God. Do you see the same similar teaching in Jericho when Joshua was told just to march around the wall and he told him how many times and when he fulfilled what God told him to do, the walls came tumbling down? Do you see it with Nam? who had leprosy, God said, you've got to do it the way I tell you to do it. You can't rely upon your ability or anyone else's ability. It has to be me, and you have to do it my way if you're going to have the victory. And he finally submitted to it, and his leprosy was taken away. So it is with Gideon. Gideon, you're still relying upon yourself. You still think you can do it. Now God says, take them down to the water. Take them down to the water. Another test is coming. And I will test f them for you there. And any one of them that say to you, shall we go to, uh, shall we 
go with you, and I say to you, shall not go with you, you shall send them home. Judges 7, verses 5 to 7 say this as we go on. The Lord speaks to Gideon, everyone, they're down at the water now, everyone, and you're not to tell them anything, you just watch them, everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set by himself. Likewise, everyone who kneels down to drink. In other words, who looks around while they're drinking? Who's aware of the enemy while they're drinking? They're not leaning down so they can't see the enemy attack them. You watch this. Who's going to do that? Well, the word of God goes on to say so clearly that God says the ones that do it the way that they should, watching for the enemy, they're going with you. But the ones that just lean down and drink with their heads down toward the water, send them home. Gideon, he didn't want to look. He knew that so many were leaning down and not lapping the water and watching. They were simply bowing their heads and they would not have known if the enemy came upon them like a flood. With that, God set into motion his supernatural plans. God has a plan. We've got to let God do his plan in our life, not figure it out for God. Have you ever heard someone say, if I was God, I'd do it this way. That's why you're not God. I don't want to do it my way. I want to do it God's way. Remember old, good old Frank Sinatra, old blue eyes? He said, and I did it my way. My wife rewrote that song, and we've sung it here. And it says, in place of that, and I did it God's way. I did it God's way. I don't know where Frank is at the moment. If he didn't know Jesus as his Savior, I do know. But I don't know whether he knew him or not. But I can tell you this. When you do it your way, it's not God's way. It has to be. You know this is the way God is leading you, and you follow it, even though it's into a battle that you can't win. So it was. So it was with him so it was with him that night it says that one of the Midianite soldiers had a dream and it spooked the whole camp who sent the dream God God sent the dream and then he sent Gideon and his 300 men that were left into the camp and Israel won the battle God's way, God's way, and the battle was won. Anyone else's way, the battle would have been lost. Number five, discouragement can hinder but never halt God's ultimate plan for victory. Don't get discouraged. Don't let discouragement take you over. Have a little talk with Jesus, and it'll change the way you're thinking. Start praising Jesus when the discouraging times come, and God will replace the discouragement with praise and assurance. The next morning, Gideon and his men came to an Israelite, Israelite town, it says, where they met a group of townsfolk, and listen to this group of townsfolk. They criticize Gideon for not including them in the battle. They hadn't volunteered for the battle. The battle had been won, but now they could only think of criticizing Gideon because no one was sent, no one sent for them. Either you're in the battle or you lose the right to receive 
what the battle-worn soldiers received, victory. There are too many Christians that are not in the battle. They are jealous of those that are in the battle. And they call them too heavenly-minded to be of any spiritual good. But that's not true. You can't be too heavenly-minded to not be of a, a spiritual good. The army of the Lord that Jesus had with him was 12 men. And they turned the world upside down with those 12 men. Why, in the name of all that's holy, cannot the multitude of Christians that exist today turn the battle around? It's because there are too many people criticizing those that are doing the fighting, that are obtaining the victory. Instead of criticize, thank God for his intervention in this situation. Number six, I love Gideon's reaction. Listen to his reaction. He refused to get discouraged. Instead, he, instead he praised the men for their desire to be part of it. Instead of complaining, instead of giving them what they deserved, he said, I'm sorry. I thank you for your desires to be part of the battle. And it changed their perspective on life. Number seven, grace for victory is extended to the exhausted. Grace for victory is extended to the exhausted. What an incredibly draining day Gideon and his man had. Yet Gideon had more than exhaustion to face. The trial was not yet complete. Gideon and his men were pursuing the Midianites when they came to a certain town and asked food for the 300 men. They were refused by this town. First of all, the first town criticized them. Second, the second town wouldn't feed those 300 men that had exhaustion and had won the battle for them. Lesson number three. Grace for victory is extended to those who are exhausted. Number eight. Even in the face of more exhaustion and hunger, Gideon knew that God was about to bring victory. He had come to the place where he now depended on God for the victory. May the same be true of us. As we continue to trust the Lord through our difficulties and our problems, our very hard circumstances, let's remember that when God is through, we will praise him. We will praise him. Number nine. Lesson number four, God doesn't stop at half a victory. God never stops at half a victory. When we follow Jesus, we can't settle for a partial victory because we're exhausted. Keep on pursuing until you have the total victory. Number 10, his plan is always for our full deliverance. And sometimes that comes only in the last half hour. When we're frustrated, tired, and can't go one more step. That's the way it was with Gideon. His men were tired and 
frustrated. And that's the way God often works in the lives of his children. Thank God Gideon never gave up his mission. He became a man of God, a man of faith, a man that trusted God even though he slay me, said Job, yet will I trust him. God is, the say, is saying the same thing to you and I today. I close with number 11. Remember every battle we face has an eternal purpose. Every battle we face has an eternal purpose. Let God fulfill that purpose in your life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of your word. And we thank you, Lord God, that you give us the strength if we'll ask you to, to stay in the battle even though we're exhausted and keep on pursuing the perfect will of God. Right now, I'd like to speak to those who have never received Christ as their Savior. You need to make that decision. There may not be much more time for you. And even if there were, you may never feel the Holy Spirit tugging at your heart and soul to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It's a simple thing. God wants to save you, but you have to acknowledge your sin and ask him to save your soul. And when you do and you mean it, he'll never let you go. You may be exhausted in pursuing the plan of God for your life, but he'll hold tight to you, and you will have the victory. If you're a Christian and you've given up pursuing because you're exhausted, don't. Renew your walk with God and continue to follow him no matter what the situation or the circumstance. Ask Jesus to make himself very apparent to you and give you a welcome home like the prodigal son received because he loves you. Father, just bless your word and these invitations in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. God bless you until we have this opportunity next week, by the grace of God, to come to you wherever you are in this world with a gospel message. We love you. God loves you. And if you've received Christ as your Savior, please let us know. You can write to us if you're in this country at the Bible Speaks in Laconia, 40 Belvedere Street, Lakeport, New Hampshire, zip code 03246. Or you can email us on the Internet at this address and let us know. Our Hornet 2 at Breezeline. Dot net. That's our hornet too at breezeline.net. Until next week, God bless you.